As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. We have a returning guest today, Galen Lehman, CEO of Lehman's Incorporated, the great off-grid supplier of electric-free living supplies to, and all kinds of uh, materials for self-sufficiency and self-reliance, who's been supplying people out of their home base in Kidron, Ohio, for over 60 years, is back with us again here on Reluctant Preppers. Galen, thank you for joining us again here on Reluctant Preppers. Glad to be here. The last time we had you on, you talked about how to get heat when the furnace is out, and tonight we have a related topic, how to get uh, lights when the lights are out. And uh, a lot of people, uh, your sister, when she was on, talked about the um, the not only the practical and uh, life impact of needing light, but also the emotional uh, impact on lowering the stress level on people in emergency situations. So we know that there's a high value. In fact, people uh, don't even necessarily talk about the electric power being out. They talk about the lights being out because it's the first and, and main thing that they'll, they'll notice. So you spoke with us a bit last time about uh, Aladdin kerosene lanterns, and we have that on our previous video. We'll link to it from this one so people can look can reference that. But we wanted to have you back on to talk to us uh, more broadly about what are options for people to make sure that they have preparedness steps ready so that if they lose their electric power, they can still provide the light they need to run their lives and their family. So if you could start us off with uh, with what you consider is kind of the range of options that are most uh, most reliable and most practical for people. Right. So what what our perspective always comes out of our roots uh, serving the Amish. And, and so our focus is on uh, old technology and, and proven technology, things that people can rely on without a lot of technical knowledge. And so as a result, uh, most of our products run on kerosene and our greatest expertise is in kerosene lighting. Uh, but before we get to kerosene, I'd like to talk just a little bit about uh, LED. LED is very popular now, and for some people it may be a good choice. The challenge is that it's very battery dependent. And for that reason, uh, and because of the short shelf life of batteries, and, and because they can't be, can't be replaced, uh, when, they, when they wear out, they're, they're done. Uh, and, and when there's not a ready supply of fresh batteries, you're, you're kind of stuck. Um, for those reasons, we, we have kept our focus on kerosene uh, despite the rise of LED. There is one thing, though, that comes in really handy, and that is a hand-cranked flashlight. Um, it's portable. It's not a, a whole lot of light output. It's not extremely powerful, but it's portable, and you can always rely on it because all you got to do is, is crank it up. And we have several models. You can even get them uh, with a radio built in so that you not only have access to light, you have access to information, which is very valuable in a disaster. And uh, what other types of high technology ones might be might people consider, uh, even though they're not the main ones that, that you're going to recommend? The, another thing, of course, is solar. Uh, the challenge there is the size of the investment uh, to have anything reliable. And once again, to have light at night, you have to be reliant on, on your battery, uh, uh, your, your stack of batteries. And, and when those batteries wear out, um, then, then you're, you're stuck. So shifting then to your main line of kerosene lighting, last time you spoke to us about uh, Aladdin lanterns, and we'll include some of the photos that you sent us uh, about those so people have a, a visual image to relate to on that. Um, and again, you were talking about, can you talk to us a little bit about the reliability, the uh, amount of light you can get out of those, uh, how, how long they can run on a, on a fuel fill, that sort of thing? Right. So the the key thing about a kerosene light is the fuel, the kerosene. And the first question people have about kerosene is how can it be stored? So you can go to the gas station and buy buy kerosene, and, and that's a good option. If you buy it that way, make sure you put it in a sealed container. Uh, and that has uh, that has uh, opaque sides, so the sunlight can't get to it. Um, the the sealed container filled about as full as you can get it, so there's no trapped oxygen inside the container. And uh, opaque sides is the way to get long-term fuel storage. If you don't want to go to the gas station, which sometimes the quality of the fuel there is a little bit uh, suspect, uh, you can also buy it at a higher price 
already packaged in sealed containers where you know the quality of the fuel is extremely high. You can get that. You can get it at the gas station for three, four dollars. You can buy it in sealed containers in a ga- in a gallon size for like around twenty or less. A five gallon around fifty dollars uh, or less, and a fifty-five gallon uh, for usually less than four hundred dollars. Plus shipping could be a factor on that one. So once you have that supply of fuel in a dark, opaque sided container that has been sealed and is nearly full so there's very little trapped oxygen you're talking about fuel that can be stored for um well what they say officially is 12 to 12 months to five years what i have learned from talking to people that have stored fuel is as long as a decade that fuel is still good still burns fine still has no odor and that type of fuel storage is that's a that's a big deal because now you've got access to light and heat if you're using a kerosene heater that will last and last and last. Okay, and then back to the actual uh, devices themselves. Uh, some people might be concerned about uh, the safety aspects of having a live flame in their home. I mean, we've we've heard stories of you know somebody the cow kicked it over and burned the barn down kind of thing. But uh, what are what are some basic considerations when when uh, using kerosene lanterns? I think the the key is to make sure that you're monitoring it. It is an open flame. You can't just let it burn and leave the room. Uh, <clears throat> if if you're monitoring it, you're keeping it away from children and away from pets. Uh, it, it's the, the risk of tipping goes way down. Uh, the 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 risk of tipping is one factor. Another factor is to make sure you have uh, good ventilation if you're using it in an underground room or a room with almost no uh, um, infiltration of air, like in a modern home where no where they wrap them in plastic. Yeah, ventilation can be a factor. So you want to make sure you have a source of fresh air. When the fuel is burned with a ready source of fresh air, uh, it doesn't produce carbon monoxide in, in any significant quantity. The carbon monoxide begins to form when there's inadequate uh, ventilation. And usually there's a big increase in odor. So when you have that big increase in odor, or when you're experiencing symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning, that is when you need to make sure you've got adequate ventilation. Um, it may mean cracking a window, or it may mean providing some some ready source, but as long as you have adequate ventilation and there's no risk of tipping, kerosene lights are very safe. What a lot of people don't know is that the flash point on kerosene is quite high. Um, the Back in the days when they sold Aladdin lamps, to demonstrate the safety of kerosene fuel back in the like in the early 20s before the before things were as complicated as they were now with with lawyers and and uh, liability issues they used to actually demonstrate kerosene now this is the safety of kerosene this is a do not do this at home moment they would drop a lighted match in an open bowl of kerosene and and as i said do not do this at home don't try it uh, that said, I did try it, and you know what happened is the same thing that happened back in the 1920s. The match goes out. Uh, it doesn't ignite. There's no surface layer of combustible gases like there is with gasoline and other fuels. So that's the safety of kerosene, and if there's adequate ventilation and you keep it away from children and pets where it could tip over, it's a very safe way to light your home. So if we could talk about the operation of the lanterns themselves as far as... Um... Can you talk us just briefly through preparation, uh, starting it up, uh, how much, how long it can you can expect it uh, to run, and uh, how much light you can get out of it? So the fuel is delivered on the on most of the lamps we sell by a wick. You can also get pressure pumped uh, kerosene lanterns, um, like a like a Coleman lantern, uh, but because of that lack of volatility that kerosene has, the pumped type lanterns are very difficult to operate. And so we don't sell a whole lot of that. Almost all of our kerosene lamps use a wick to deliver the fuel. So the wick has to be clean. Uh, if you if you burn fuel that's contaminated, it's best to replace the wick. Uh, we're talking about something that's relatively inexpensive there. You should probably keep a couple extras on hand. The wick is like a woven cotton cloth uh, that absorbs fuel and, and delivers it up to where you're going to be burning it. The simplest lights 
are are kerosene wick lanterns. The only thing in the lantern is the wick, and the wick is providing all the light. One common misnomer that people think is happening is that the wick is actually being burned. Uh, That's not happening except at a very, very slow rate because the kerosene ignites at a lower temperature than the cotton and the wick will burn at. The wicks will be consumed slightly over time, but in a kerosene lamp, a, a wick may last with continuous use, like every night use, the wick may last for months, uh, even even half a year. So it is important to keep a couple extra wicks on hand. If you have contaminated fuel, you need to replace the wick, or if the wick is consumed by usage over time. Uh, but generally speaking, the wicks will last for a long time. And this is why we like kerosene light, uh, kerosene lighting. It's the simplicity of it. Uh, nothing more than a cotton strip is delivering the fuel to where it needs to burn. The burner itself is typically made out of brass. Uh, there are some cheaper burners that are brass plated steel, but the best ones are made of brass. And, and it's the simplicity is amazing. I mean, you can look at it, turn it over in your hands, turn the wick adjustment knob, and you can just see exactly how everything works. And if something breaks, it means it's much simpler to repair as well. Uh, if you look at it, you know how it works. And that's, that's the, that's a great point of, uh, kerosene is the, is the simplicity of it. So, uh, in a simple wick lamp, um, the, the flame height is adjusted by turning the wick up and down at, at a low setting, uh, it's adequate to kind of see your way around the room but not see any details. At a high setting, um, you could read by it, but it's eye strain. Um, I've done it for extended periods of time. Uh, and, and like I said, it's eye strain, but you can read by it. And then uh, I, I think I would equate it with a wick lantern with maybe the power of maybe six or seven candles at one time. Uh, good size candles, not birthday cake candles. After the typical wick lamp, uh, the next step up would be to go to Aladdin. And the advantage of an, of an Aladdin lamp is that in addition to the wick, there's a mantle like a Pullman lantern has in it. The mantle is suspended above the wick. And when the heat from the flame hits it, it, it incandesces, it glows with brilliant white light uh, similar to an electric light. So for serious light, for light you can read by without straining your eyes, Aladdin is the answer for most people. And how much, uh, is there any additional or different care that's needed for a Aladdin-type lamp that has a mantle as opposed to a simple kerosene wick lantern? I think the biggest thing with an Aladdin lamp is the care and protection of the mantle. The mantle is very fragile. If you've ever worked with a Coleman lantern, you know how fragile I'm talking about. Uh, but but that fragility is the only limitation. When you compare it to a Coleman lantern, a Coleman lantern makes a lot of noise. It's constantly hissing. An Aladdin lamp is completely silent. So you're getting essentially the same light. It's room-filling white light that you can read by, but it's totally silent. A Coleman lantern has to be pumped and, and has to be calibrated often to, as the pressure drops to, to either pump it up or, or change the valve setting so that you maintain the same light output. Uh, with an Aladdin, you don't have to do that. Uh, you do have to stay in the room. You have to monitor it just like you do with any kerosene light. But you, you, you can calibrate it so much more easily and so much less often. And there's no pumping. All you do is turn up the wick, light it, put the mantle on and you're set to go. Um, the fragility of the mantles though means that you should probably keep a larger supply on hand. Uh, I talked in my, in our last interview about how, what you're exactly preparing for. Are you preparing for a month long time without electric or a few days without electric or years without electric for preparation for years without electric? I think you need a couple dozen mantles on hand. If you're preparing for a month or two, then keeping three or four or five mantles on hand is, is probably sufficient. If you're careful with them, like 
like I am with a little bit of experience, I can make a banner last all year. Um, but you're, you're the first one I broke, I was like, wow, that's really fragile. I knew it was fragile, but I didn't realize how fragile. Uh, the key is not to allow the lamp to be jolted or banged around. Is, uh, in addition to leaving them setting on a solid surface, not near an edge where they can be bumped into or whatever, is there an option of hanging hanging them from a, a chain or hook from the ceiling to keep them out of out of harm's way or, or putting them on a wall sconce or something like that? Yeah, one of the advantages of the Aladdin is that it's, it's not a generic product like a flat wick lamp is. There's really no brands in flat wick lamps, so the quality can vary a lot. <clears throat> With Aladdin, you've got consistent quality and you've got a whole variety of lamp designs. Uh, you can put them on a table, you can mount them in a bracket on the wall, and you can hang them in the middle of the room like a chandelier. Uh, there's also a lot of different uh, looks, like uh, you, you can get you can get a red one, you can get a blue one, you can get a green one, uh, you can get brass, you can get uh, aluminum. The materials that they make that they're made from is a very wide range, and and the the workmanship and the quality is very high. So that what you end up with with all these wide range of materials being used is a, a a lamp of beauty, a lamp of very high quality, a lamp that can become part of your decor, that you that you can even pass on to your kids. It can become an heirloom, and and that is one of the advantages of Aladdin. Besides the function, is just the sheer beauty of their products. And uh, on operation, we heard uh, one of our viewers commented uh, last time that you have to clean the soot out of the out of the uh, chimney, the glass chimney above the mantle. Uh, how do you avoid that, or how do you do it properly if you need to? Cleaning cleaning the soot is not a problem. When you see the soot on the chimney, it's black and it looks like it's going to be a big job, but it just wipes off. So um, what I've done is just taken a rag on the end of a of a fork or or some kitchen utensil that I just push the rag up through the uh, uh, up through the chimney. If the burn, if the soot is burned on severely, you can use Windex or any kind of glass cleaner to to get it off. There is one thing on the Aladdin that's a little quirky. Uh, as the lamp warms up, the fuel gets uh, warmer as well and becomes and and gets to where it flows more easily. It gets more. It gets less viscous. It gets more runny. And that means that the lamp begins to get a little bit brighter. In addition, as the air going through the lamp becomes warmer, uh, it rises faster and flows through the lamp more, providing the lamp with more oxygen. So when you first light them, you need to have them set at about half of normal brightness. And over the next 20 minutes or so, the lamp will reach full brightness on its own. If you make a mistake and go too high in the beginning, as the lamp gets brighter, it can uh, get a kind of flame that comes up to the mantle, and this is not something that you want. For one thing, it makes odor and smoke. For another thing, as that flame rises up to the mantle, it leaves a carbon buildup on the mantle itself in addition to the inside of your chimney. That carbon buildup on the mantle makes the mantle turn black, and then the mantle won't show light like it used to. And a lot of people that are inexperienced will look at that and say, oh, the mantle's ruined. That's not actually the case. If you turn the flame down again, the mantle, the carbon on the mantle will burn off and the mantle will return to normal function. But this issue of the lamp getting brighter on its own is a big part of why you need to monitor the lamp, especially in the early stages. Now, it can, it can, uh, um, mod the light level can change if conditions in the room change if if there's a draft or something like that so it has to be monitored all the time but it especially needs to be monitored during the first 20 minutes while the lamp is still warming up because the flame out the uh, light output will change significantly and and you don't want that flame up condition because of the uh i mean i've seen in severe cases i've seen where the flame is coming up above the top of the chimney it can be frightening and you don't want that, and that's why it's very important to monitor the lamp. And this is specifically the Aladdin lamp that does this. It has to be monitored during the first 20 minutes or so that you're using it. Any other considerations that uh, any other long-term care other than change, finally changing out the wick uh, once a month or whenever it finally finally is consumed over a long period of time or changing out the lamp? When, when do you know it's necessary to change out the mantle? It's basically 
crumbles, it falls apart, you'll see that it's just not, not working properly? Yeah, it'll crumble or tear. That's your key on the mantle. Uh, the uh, wicks, when you, when you get to the place where you can't turn the wick up anymore, uh, and, and, and there's no, it has a long tail that hangs down in the tank, you can't, that tail begins to draw up. Uh, that's when you know that it's time to replace the wick. What we would recommend keeping for a month to two month long disaster, we're talking significant, a significant kind of really uh, a bad disaster, but not a lifelong disaster. What we recommend keeping for that is an extra chimney, uh, a couple extra wicks, and if you have an Aladdin, four or five extra mantles, that, that would be like over the top preparation and then keep maybe five gallons of kerosene. I think on a wick, a simple wick light, you can expect to burn, uh, um, maybe two quarts a night. That would be, I'm talking being extra prepared. So that tells you how much kerosene you should store, depending how long of a disaster you're preparing for, uh, with an Aladdin, you burn about a quart a night. Um, and again, this is, this is with constant use every night. So then the other thing to keep on hand is the fuel, of course. Any other considerations that uh, we haven't asked about how to get light when the electricity is out? Um, just remember that light is one of the things you're going to want. <laughs> you can get by without it. It's not like water or food. You can't get by without those. But uh, if, you're, if you're in a place where, uh, like, like in the winter, where it gets dark early, those nights are very, very long without light and uh, so much more pleasurable uh, when you, than all of you can gather around the light and uh, you can play games, you can read. Uh, time goes much faster. Well, Galen Lehman, CEO of Lehman's Hardware, thank you so much for joining us again on Reluctant Preppers. We'd love to have you back again or one of your um, associates there to talk about how to get water when the tap won't run. We're glad to help, and uh, it, was, it was a joy talking with you.